Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be calling in from today. Thank you again so much for joining us. Once again, my name is Melissa Bauer. I am the Director of Sustainability at the Pet Sustainability Coalition, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. We are very excited about this topic and this guest speaker, so let's dive in and get started. Um, just a quick reminder of uh, technology instead of uh, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, everybody has joined the call today um, with their video and audio turned off. However, we really encourage you to take advantage of the chat function and the Q&A function to ask questions, introduce yourself or chat um, at any time during the webinar. We have several members of uh, the PSC team monitoring that um, and will help you if you're having any audio issues. Also, we'll be monitoring questions during the course of the presentation today um, and leaving plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, we will also be sending a recording of this to everyone who registered for the webinar and it will also be available on all of our publicly available webinar challenge uh, channels, excuse me, such as our YouTube and website. So a brief introduction into the Pet Sustainability Coalition. We are a nonprofit industry association that works with about 180 different companies throughout the supply chain and the pet industry. So everyone from retailers to brands, manufacturers, distributors, suppliers. We're also a global organization. We have about 60% of our membership in North America spread out throughout uh, the US and Canada. Uh, we also have about 30% of our membership in Europe and another 10% in Asia and Australia. We're also growing very fast. Uh, so if you'd like to know more about PSC, uh, please feel free to ask some questions in our chat box and our staff would be happy to help you. We serve a dual focus at the Pet Sustainability Coalition. We have a consulting team here at PSC that helps individual companies improve their sustainability performance for what it actually means for their individual company and business goals. But we also uh, bring together different members of the supply chain and the pet space to address large scale environmental issues that are too large for a single company to handle. One of those initiatives you might have heard of is Flex Forward, which is our innovative uh, return to retail reverse logistics program in which we are implementing reverse logistics to collect packaging um, from the pet industry and help tackle these 300 pounds of uh, pet packaging that's going to the landfill here in North America. But as we've been introducing this program, we've gotten a lot of questions about what is reverse logistics? What does this mean for my business? Um, how can we implement it? And that brings us to our rock star speaker today who I'm thrilled to introduce you to. Um, it is Megan Knowlton from the Director of Sustainability at Opturo. Um, and she is a rock star in the sustainability space. So she oversees initiatives that help retailers and brands use reverse logistics to, to build a more circular business model and reduce waste and emissions in the reverse supply chain. So super excited to hear from you. Good morning, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Good morning and good afternoon from me and from this ray of noon sun that is hitting me. I'm here in Washington, D.C., I am going to share my screen so you all can see this little presentation that I've brought along today. So let me share that. Okay, so you should be seeing a full screen of my presentation here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Again, thanks for having me. Um, as, as Melissa shared, I am the Director of Sustainability at Optoro. We are a reverse logistics technology company. Um, and I'd love to share a little bit about my learnings on holiday returns and on uh, sustainability in retail and how those two come together. Um, I know that we have a number of different retailers as well as retail brands here today. And so I'll share a little bit about the considerations for both of those. 
So just a quick intro to who Optoro is, what we do, and kind of where I've got um, knowledge. So Optoro is an innovative cloud-based returns optimization platform, and we are working with retailers and brands to help them optimize how they process disposition and to manage their inventory and sending them to their next best homes. So this includes everything from kind of that initial returns initiation experience for the customer, um, as well as where those items get routed to once they've been returned within a retailer or brand supply chain. Um, and then we enable those, those clients of ours to determine where the optimal resale channel is for those returned products. Um, or if it's not a resale channel, then it's an alternative channel like donation or recycling. Uh, we've had privilege to work with some of the largest retailers and brands in the US today. And some of these are, are very committed to sustainability and to the circular economy as well. Um, I've got highlighted on this slide a close partnership we have with IKEA, um, which here in the US is their, their partner company, or their, excuse me, their um, parent company is Inca Group. Um, and so that's Inca's uh, CEO, Jesper, speaking about how, you know, we work together to power them toward or to enable them to achieve their uh, circular economy goals. Um, so, of course, it's it's really, you know, reassuring and great to have such a substantial figure in the retail space um, acknowledge the work that we can do together and um, that we work with a number of different types of companies across pretty much all product categories. Uh, we're also a member of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a circular economy based group as well. Um, so we're a, a mission based company really dedicated to sustainability. Uh, so I, I always have a good time and um, kind of working at that fun intersection of technology, retail and sustainability. Uh, so you know, just to kick us off with uh, kind of setting the stage on sustainability and why we care. I, I bet we all have seen this, both this photo and this stat before, right? Um, by the year 2050, United Nations estimates we're going to need the equivalent of three planets worth of natural resources to sustain our current lifestyles, as well as, um, and that includes our consumption habits. Um, and you know, as we're as we're going through that, we're also seeing that the drive in in consumers in customers across the US and across the world truly um, is towards sustainability and towards um, companies showing their values and putting their money where their mouths are essentially. So it's that triple bottom line um, that customers are looking for. And so it's not just enough for companies to be making money anymore. Um, they have to be making a positive impact on society and the environment as well. Um, which I'm sure is why you all are here. Uh, you know this keenly and you know it probably from your own values as well. I mean, I know that's why I'm here. Um, so, you know, I have a stat here from a couple years ago um, of, you know, 78% of Americans wanting that from companies. But, you know, there are so many different stats out there um, on different ways that we've surveyed consumers to see how they care about values or about the environment. We're seeing that millennials and Gen Z care even more and are actually making decisions about where to buy from if based on values, um, as well as where not to buy from. So, you know, if a company uh, makes a mistake or steps back on a value, um, you know, a social value or an environmental value, then um, then you know consumers are quicker and quicker to step back from um, bringing their business to those retailers. Um, I put a graph here that I grabbed from a recent Salesforce report, which I thought was super interesting, um, that highlights how this year during 2020, amidst everything going on around us, consumers are caring more and more about the values of the retailers and brands that they're shopping from. So they're paying more attention to those values. They are choosing more often to stop buying from a company or to start buying from a company based on shared values as well. Um, and, you know, more than 50% of consumers believe that they have the power to make an influence on companies. So they're voting with their wallets. And then, you know, kind of jumping off of that trend that we're seeing, of course, COVID means that there's been huge change in retail. And uh, I'm sure everybody representing every brand and group here um, knows that keenly. So 
you know, one of the major trends this year is the rise in e-commerce um, due to COVID. Um, so, you know, the Commerce Department reported that in quarter two of this year, there was a 44% increase in e-com spending over the same time last year. So, you know, there was an increase, increase in e-com. Some of that switched from brick and mortar to e-com. Um, and then, you know, McKinsey reported in a similar vein that this year, just in the period of eight weeks earlier in the pandemic, I think it was eight weeks, um, consumers and businesses alike had accelerated their switch to digital strategies by five years. So, you know, the, the original projections for the amount of digital strategies uh, would have put us where we are now at five years from now. And that's and that's because COVID has, has rapidly ramped up our need for digital and contactless uh, purchasing. I think the other thing that's not on this slide that's worth noting is that e-commerce, of course, has its own challenges. And one of those is, is the rate of returns in particular. So um, e-com shopping tends to see a much higher rate of returns than traditional brick and mortar, usually a, by about two to three times the brick and mortar rate. So brick and mortar, we tend to see about 10-11% um, of purchases get returned on average, while e-com can be around 30%. And that does vary based on the category. Um, we tend to see the highest return rates with e-com uh, apparel and footwear, um, but it, it can really depend um, on the consumer and on the category as well. Let me switch it, there we go. So uh, leading into the holiday season, we are right about to hit peak. Uh, you know, we're at Black Friday and Cyber Monday coming up. Um, we are, so Optoro surveyed about 2000 consumers last month in October. And our findings were that 80% of the respondents said that they planned on doing the majority of their shopping online this holiday season versus just 19% last year. So that's a huge acceleration in the number of people doing uh, their, their shopping online for the holidays. And about 24% of the respondents said that they would end up returning holiday purchases or they would return about 24% of their purchases. Um, so that's nearly one out of every four purchases. Uh, so that's gonna be you know, just a huge amount of items going back to retailers, whether it's in store if possible, depending on COVID closures or it's e-com. Um, we work with UPS and UPS reported last year on the peak returns day that there were about 1.8 million returns sent through UPS just in one day on peak returns day, which was January 2nd, last, this last holiday season. Um, so we're looking forward to the newest, latest and greatest projections from UPS soon about what they think is going to happen this, this season since e-commerce is high um, and everybody's you know, at home um, doing their online shopping. So we're, we're really curious to see kind of how that happens. And then of course, if people are unable or unwilling to make their returns um, or repurchases in stores, what does that mean for shipping um, and for e-commerce? So, um, you know, there, as I mentioned, there are heightened sustainability challenges for e-com. Um, we do, we make uh, environmental impact models for the retailers and brands that we work with. And when I compared the e-com returns programs with the brick and mortar returns programs, I found that e-com tended to produce about 23% more waste to landfill in products alone, not including cardboard and shipping materials um, than the brick and mortar returns. So that's simply items that end up getting uh, sent to landfill either by the retailer or brand themselves when they get it back into a DC, simply not having the capacity to handle it or send it to its next best home. Um, and also in the downstream value chain as well. So passing along those products to, the, to their next homes, which might be a liquidator, it might be an um, outlet store uh, or something like that. Um, in terms of last mile delivery, that of course is a huge consideration in e-commerce environmental impacts. Um, WEF reported earlier this year that by 2030, there would be an additional 6 million tons of carbon dioxide emitted um, just in last mile delivery for e-com packages. 
that's not including the reverse shipments for that increase in e-com. And frankly, I think this report from WEF came out before COVID was really ramping up, certainly before the US went into lockdown. So I'm curious to see how that kind of stat has changed and will change in the future. I think it, there's just no way of truly knowing. Um, and then, you know, another stat here from another organization called Lime Loop about um, how many trees were going to be used for creating cardboard boxes for e-commerce shipments um, by 2021. Um, again, with the rapid acceleration in e-commerce this year, I'm curious to see how that kind of um, how that kind of estimate might be different now and how it could be different next year. So, you know. The traditional method of handling returns and reverse inventory, so, so anything that didn't sell, end of life products, maybe products that just are out of season now, um, traditional reverse logistics. They're costly, it's inefficient, and it creates a ton of waste. So you typically have the customer sending in a product, um, maybe they're going into a carrier store like UPS or FedEx to drop it off, or they're going into the retail store to, to return it directly to the customer service desk. Um, from there, there's maybe a small amount going to landfill just straight from there, or it's going back to the retailer or brand's own DC, or maybe a third party DC. From there, a bunch of stuff gets grouped together into huge truckloads, and you know, maybe depending on the category and the level of brand protection that a, that a brand has, they might send it just straight to landfill from there. Uh, I think we've all seen reports in the past from big companies, you know, about big exposés on, oh, this company sends all of their extra excess stuff to landfills and incineration. Um, so, you know, sometimes products are going to landfill because there's just no capacity or limited interest in, um, in being able to send those goods to a resale channel. Um, or they're getting grouped together in truckloads, maybe after sitting in the warehouse for a long time and eventually getting liquidated at barely pennies on the dollar. Um, eventually liquidators will send those to, you know, entirely different channels like wholesalers, maybe discount storefronts, flea markets, et cetera, on and on down the value chain until the product has been jostled around and shipped around with all of these 10 billion needless shipments in a year. Um, and eventually the next user will get that product in their hands or not, and it's gone to landfill or maybe recycling. Um, we've, Optoro has estimated that in a given year in the US alone, we see about 5 billion pounds of waste uh, just from the products, not from the cardboard, um, coming from, from returns and about 15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, and I, uh, I'm interested in, in redoing this analysis, frankly, um, with more recent times in mind and with the higher rate of e-com. So um, I'm curious to see if those 5 billion and 15 million numbers have changed recently. So um, just to kind of tag on to the point of this webinar today, how retailers and brands are looking to make their holiday return strategies more sustainable. So uh, based on what I'm seeing, what our clients are doing and what others in the retail return sustainability market are doing right now, I, I bucketed these into three different major Grouping. So the first thing that retailers are doing is offering customers package list returns, um, which also is syncing very nicely with the kind of contactless experience that customers are looking for right now during COVID-19. Um, there's also kind of optimizing the routing and shipping as well as offsetting uh, carbon emissions from shipping. And then finally, um, there's re-commerce and refurbishment to resale. Um, so keeping products in use for as long as possible. So the first one, package list returns, um, companies are working together to um, share their resources, share their supply chains, or maybe in-store assets uh, in order to, um, to collect uh, returns from customers. Um, you know, often with contactless returns as well, the consumer can get a QR code to show on their phone to an associate at a store, and then the associate there 
um, can scan that and then they know what it is and they can send it back to the retailer and they don't even need the um, packaging or the original shipping box, anything like that. So I've included some examples on this slide. Um, I bet we're all familiar with the Kohl's Amazon partnership. You can bring Amazon packages um, directly to a Kohl's while you're already doing some shopping. Of course, this assumes that you can go in person, right? Um, and the same with, uh, we actually, Optoro launched a partnership recently with Staples for package list returns. So customers of some of the brands and retailers that we work with can choose to get a QR code on their phone, bring their return back to a Staples while they're already going there for printing something or picking up supplies um, and you know whatever it might be. And while they're there, they can also return their item. That has the positive benefit of allowing customers to group their trips together. And so when you are giving people driving their personal vehicles the opportunity to group all of their errands together, you're saving hugely on carbon emissions there. So um, while it's a little bit harder to put your finger on that benefit for the retailer or brand, um, you are seeing that uh, you know, that the carbon emissions from the customer driving um, to go drop something off can be vastly improved by grouping trips together. Um, you're also allowing for a reduction in carbon, um, or uh, excuse me, in cardboard. So if the customer has long since gotten rid of their original packaging for their item, but they are still within the return window and they want to return it, offering them Packageless and labelless returns allows us to cut back on cardboard waste and also on paper or you know those stickers waste as well. Um, UPS has their own offering as well called No Box No Label Returns. Um, I personally used that before with an Amazon uh, return. I think I had gotten rid of the box and. Um, I think I even opened the item. It wasn't even in its original packaging anymore, but they they took it back based on the QR code I had from an email. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. And then the next one that kind of fits in with the shipping there is uh, is optimizing your routing of returns as soon as possible. So from as close to the returns initiation experience as possible. So if you can use technology to make decisions about where those products should go once they get back to UPS or Staples or behind a counter somewhere or into a, a shipping carriers DC, wherever that is, um, then you can route that item to its next best home as quickly as possible reducing the number of unnecessary shipments um, or touches to it and reducing the chance of potentially breaking or, or damaging it in some ways. Um, so there's also kind of along with this, the fact that some companies are choosing to um, offset their carbon footprints as well um, so that they can kind of decrease the, the carbon associated with e-com orders. A great example here is Etsy, which offsets all of their, com their carbon from all e-com orders throughout the year. They're working with a, an organization called Three Degrees to do that. Um, another recent example is Shopify's announcement this week that they are offsetting all carbon from shipping of any orders that went through their platform, that go through their platform on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. I've also included here a, a, a little cutout from uh, UPS as well, since they're doing carbon neutral shipping, um, you can opt in to doing a carbon neutral shipment as well. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, I think offsetting is great, but it, it, it doesn't solve the solution, right? You still are emitting carbon and then paying to have it be offset elsewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the kind of better thing to do, right, in the world of sustainability is, is first thinking about where you can try to reduce your impact in the first place. So using that technology to improve the routing of where items go um, is, is ideal first and then offset what you can't improve. Um, so, you know, if, if a customer can input data on uh, in the returns portal online of, hey, I'm returning this item, it's in new condition, it's just the wrong color or it's too big for my dog or whatever it is, um, and then it can get sent to its next best home, maybe as quickly as possible to the next consumer or to the store, um, then you can avoid unnecessary shipments. Um, I think it, it's important to note here too that that kind of information can create data insights for retailers and brands to, um, 
to track the reasons returns were initiated and um, information on how to either avoid returns next time, um, how to plan for orders or for, um, or for better product development in the future, as well as just improving your listings online too. Like if you've got a number of consumers returning something because it's the wrong color, um, then maybe your order listing has the color incorrectly um, in the photos or in the description. So those kinds of insights, if you're using technology to process your returns, um, that can be really helpful to, to glean from them. And then finally, the last bucket I've put here is re-commerce and refurbishment and resale. So, you know, so many retailers and brands out there are using lots of different ways of reselling um, their returns, as well as um, any other reverse inventory, so anything that didn't sell, et cetera. Um, so some of these that are making splashy headlines and have been for a while now are branded take back and resale programs. Um, you know, Patagonia's Warnware is a really great, um, you know, and, and standing example. Best Buy has a trade-in program um, where they give you, you know, a, a store gift card uh, to trade in your, your electronic item, and then they resell it um, as well, and they'll, they'll refurbish it if they need to. Some of the uh, secondary marketplaces available to retailers include eBay, Amazon, Poshmark, ThreadUp, but you know there's there's so many different options out there, um, and I think we are seeing a rise though in the um, in the the retailer or brand owned resale. So maybe it's secondhand on their website, or if the item is in high quality, then it's going directly back to stock as well. And having technology in place to help you decide whether an item can go back into stock or can go on to a secondary marketplace. That's key for being able to, to kind of build the business case around actually handling your returns at all. Um, I have a, a couple other examples up here, including uh, Nike's, Nike's approved uh, rescue program, which is uh, refurbished Nike's for sale on, on the rescue site. And this just leads me into kind of a quick explanation of, of what Optoro does. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we're a mission-based program or a mission-based company. Our, our mission is to make retail more sustainable by eliminating all waste from returns. Um, my, my personal mission as well is, is to enable the circular economy um, with our platform by allowing retailers to, uh, to resell um, items for reuse. So you know, that, that last bucket there, the re-commerce and refurbishment, that's key because um, we know, if you know anything about life cycle assessment in products, in consumer products, then you know that the majority, the vast majority of a product's um, environmental footprint is based in the sourcing and manufacturing of that product. So if we can keep a product in use for as long as possible and allow it to get used, even if you're emitting carbon to ship it around, um, almost always it's going to be more impactful for the environment to keep products, um, to keep them in use. So sending them to their next best home, to their next consumer um, is exactly um, the kind of the most impactful way. Um, and that's all part of the circular economy framework. Um, so, uh, so our company, you know, our mission is to, is to help our clients um, do just that and keep their products in use. Um, so we have, you know, our platform kind of does everything from the returns experience for consumers online, um, as well as the decision making engine for our retailer clients around um, where those items should get routed to and how they can either get resold or if they can't be resold, then uh, sent to an alternate channel like donate or recycle as well. Um, this is just a quick uh, summary of the environmental impact models that I run for our um, for our programs. So I'm proud to kind of uh, toot, toot our own horn and, and um, share that in the last year, we've been able to help our um, our partners keep 96% of their reverse inventory out of landfills. Of course, we're always trying to reduce that last 4% to even less. Um, and so constantly looking at new and creative alternative channels like um, at least donations or interesting new recycling programs or refurbishment. 
Um, and then there are a few other environmental, average environmental impact benefits that we're able to see from our programs, um, including a, an increase in the number of items resold, which again is powering that circular economy mindset for, for some of our clients. And that is the end of my presentation. I see we've had a couple of questions sent in through the chat. So I'll just go straight to that and um, ask Melissa to come back and join me. Hello, welcome, uh, Megan. Great job. I'm. Uh, you have me so geeking out on this data. I can't even explain. I'm sitting here. My partner is one of those. I'll just buy it and then return it if it doesn't fit people. And so, like, we're gonna have a talk tonight. Him and I am. But um, we've had a lot of uh, great questions coming in. Um, so we're gonna get to as many as we can. Um, the first uh, question we've been getting, we got from actually quite a few people, Megan, is that a lot of the retailers that you referenced are kind of these big multinationals. Is there opportunities for kind of smaller or even single store um, retail opportunities for them to be involved in this as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a great question. So in my mind, it makes sense for smaller companies to start thinking about their reverse logistics strategy from early on in, in their scaling um, journey, because you know the larger you get, the more complex it gets. So if you can start including reverse logistics into your business strategy as you're growing, um, then you're only going to be setting yourself up to to um, reap more of those benefits of increased um, margin recovery or recovery on the margin of those products um, as you go. So essentially, you know, we're uh, obviously, I think my, my company's software and similar companies' uh, solutions are, are meant to help you um, get a little bit of the value back on those products that got returned or that didn't sell, um, you know, which you might just be, uh, writing off as cost instead if you can get a little bit of that money back um, and also be more sustainable, uh, keep products out of landfill, um, get them into the hands of other consumers. One thing I love about e-commerce as well is that if something's getting resold at a lower price point on another, maybe it's another marketplace or maybe it's at a goodwill or, or it's going through a charity of some kind, then you're opening up the access of your products to people who maybe couldn't afford them at their original price point. Now, I know that you know some brands aren't interested in that, right? Like there are brands out there that are interested in brand protection and, and they don't necessarily want um, everybody to be able to just get their get their products at any price point. And, and with that in mind, then there are kind of the, the brand protected e-commerce solutions as well that are like branded resale. And you can kind of put the sustainability and secondhand story behind it, um, especially if there's refurbishment there, it might actually be at a slightly higher price as well. Um, so I think that was kind of a, a ramble to say that there are so many different options out there. And I know that that can be a little daunting, um, but the, you know, the first, thing I think to, to start thinking about is um, seeing obviously what the big players are doing, but the small players can do it as well. Um, especially if you've got a, you know, your small core team who you're able to train and work on together and you share values on keeping all of your products in use, keeping your products, um, you know, as valuable as possible, then that means that you've got this great opportunity of people who really care about your brand and your company and your impact. Um, so I think that that's really where, where opportunity is. Um, I'm loving this. We have like so many questions coming in. People are like super jazzed. Um, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, uh, Cherish, you've got a great question. I want to get to that in just a minute um, about food and consumables. Are those, can we, can we interact that way? Um, but one that I want to get to first that's phrased a couple of different ways for a couple of different people are like, we're bought in. This is great. But Black Friday is next week. Um, is there anything like we can do now or, you know, kind of get us through the short term? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in terms of like immediate actions you can take. I think there are, there are a few, um, obviously we are, we've all, we're already going into holiday season. Like it, it's too late to change our holiday strategies right now. Um, there are op opportunities out there for adding on offsets um, to carbon offsets to the shipments that you do, um, or you can calculate the carbon from them after the fact and, and offset it that way. Of course, 
you know, to me, it makes sense to be um, marketing that you are doing so um, either through, depending on the size of your brand, maybe it's your website, maybe it's your social channels. I think that is kind of a, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but it's a like quick way of um, being able to kind of plug into to um, making your your holidays more sustainable um, or a little bit less impactful. Um, I think that there's also opportunity for simply um, educating your customers about, about the impact of either e-commerce shipments or returns. Um, obviously, we don't wanna stop people from ordering things online, but if we can educate them about um, you know, give them as much information as possible on our listings online so that the customer really goes into that purchase knowing exactly what they're getting, um, then that can really make a difference as well um, and reduces the potential need for, um, for returning in the first place. Um, you know, I mean, gosh, this is probably a little bit less of a short-term solution, but I've actually seen some companies out there experiment with offering incentives for not returning something. So um, I don't know if this exists anymore, but Jet.com, for example, used to give a small discount on a product by if a consumer selected um, the option to like, I opt into this being final sale and not returning it. Um, and then you'd get like a little discount on it, um, which I thought was really cool. Um, and, you know, so, something that's, that's worth continuing to try. Um, I think probably the, the putting more information, more photos around your listings, at least the ones that maybe have a higher rate of return or maybe aren't selling super well, um, that can be a really good strategy as well. Yeah, I love that. So Chantelle actually asked a great question. Thank you, Chantelle, about instead of looking at returns more green, should we not be working towards um, having consumers actually make them buy more consciously and buy less? So I think you got that um, answered pretty well. Um, if there's anything you'd like to add, please do so. But I want to make sure we get to this question um, from Cherish. Cherish, thank you. Um, she asks, um, our industry sees many returns with food and other consumables versus reusable supplies. I know some a lot of the, the examples you used were kind of Patagonia kind of things. Um, with food safety as a concern, are there models in the human food industry we may look to for solutions for consumable food treats? Is that something that Opturos helps with at all? That is a really great question. Um, and something where I'm like, great, do we have like a food expert that we can bring, like food circular economy? There are so many great thinkers out there on circular food systems. I am not one of them on food. However, um, Optoro does handle consumables sometimes um, from some of our clients. Um, and we have, we do sometimes get uh, pet food and treats and, you know, canned food, all of that good stuff. Um, obviously, you guys are going to know better than, than me that pet food in particular, the large bags of like dog or cat kibble, I mean, gosh, those are hard to handle. They're heavy and there's um, the shelf life issue. And then of course there's pests issue as well with the shipping and then storage um, and all of that. So um, those can be really difficult. What I will say is that I've seen successful um, and have participated in successful donation programs for food, both human food and um, pet food as well. Um, we get really great interest from a number of um, pet related charities or you know animal, um, animal shelters and that kind of thing um, are always asking us about donations of pet food, um, as well as, you know, supplies, toys, uh, litter, um, all of those good things. So, um, you know, obviously that's not resale, that's not recovering money. Um, you know, with, with many returns, you can claim a tax deduction um, dependent on, you know, a few different factors of, of your business, but usually there is a, a tax deduction available from the donation of returns to um, to nonprofits. So at least there's that kind of financial benefit, um, as well as the wonderful benefit of helping, you know, doggies and kitties and shelters um, get the kibble and litter that they need. So we do see that happening. Um, I, I think as well, there can also be um, bulk sales like 
kind of like tr traditional liquidation or um, maybe even just pallet sales to resellers. That might be a little tougher with, with food, especially out of date food. And often, you know, state by state, there can be regulations around um, whether you can resell the food at all. So donations really tend to be a, kind of an easier, an easier one to tap into uh, for food. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my knowledge on the circular food thing, um, but I'd love to see uh, you know, a, another speaker do kind of even more about um, different networks and systems around that. Yes, perhaps follow up webinar. I'm loving that. Yeah. All right, we've, we've got so much great discussion. I love this. And so I'm going to kind of, but also want to be respectful of your time, Megan. So we've got a couple of different questions that I'm going to kind of try and meld into one. Um, we're getting a lot of questions of like from a consumer point of view, right? Like how can I make sure that, you know, the companies that I'm supporting or how can I know in advance if a company is looking into green shipping or how can I um, encourage the, the companies or brands that I'm working with to be involved in this process? So there's, there's quite a few questions kind of you know, from a consumer point of view, um, what can we be doing to kind of influence behavior, both from kind of ourselves to be more responsible consumers, but also uh, kind of influence where we're making our purchasing decisions? Sure. No, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I'd say first things first is educating yourself on the brands and retailers that you're shopping from, right? So um, luckily, if if a brand or retailer, just like yourselves, I'm sure, is participating in something, in some kind of program or strategy that is about sustainability, um, they're going to be talking about it somewhere. Um, so the, the lucky part of my job and those of us who work in sustainability is that um, sometimes I can just Google, like, uh, you know, um, Petco sustainability, and I bet I can find something that you guys have have published before, um, just like Optoro and you know the stuff that I've shared with you today. It's all over our website, right? So just like just like that, um, you can find pretty good information about what a company does, both from their website, but then I'd also you know suggest if you really want to get deeper on on whether a company truly is sustainable, what's greenwashing, what's not. I mean, first you can check a take a look at their impact report or sustainability report if they have one. Um, and then um, another key place I like to go is assessments, um, sometimes rankings by industry groups. Um, so, you know, you can sometimes find, I'm thinking particularly um, less relevant to, to this group, but more as a consumer, I suppose, uh, you know, if somebody's giving you clothing or you're considering clothing or, or giving clothing or shoes this holiday season, there are a number of um, fashion industry groups um, out there doing rankings on like, who are the most transparent or sustainable uh, fashion brands, um, which, which have been really interesting to read. So I think like, uh, global fashion agenda or um, what's it called like fashion revolution. Um, I think they have a couple different reports out there like that. Um, so I urge you to just kind of do some sleuthing online and see where you can find what companies are doing and if they're aligning with their value with your values or not. Um, in terms of in terms of returns, it can be kind of hard to figure out who's doing something. Um, you know, responsible with their returns or not, that can be kind of tough because um, sometimes it's more of a like behind the scenes business related thing. Um, the ones who are really doing something are going be up and beyond, uh, above and beyond. They're going to be the ones who have like secondhand marketplaces or maybe they're um, currently listing things as, um, you know, like new open box, um, something like that. I'd also highly recommend that for your holiday shopping this year, you consider going to secondary marketplaces because those are the products that are already existing. They didn't sell in their original channel for some reason. Maybe they've been shipped around or whatever. And you're avoiding indicating to the company okay, you have huge demand for this product. You should make a, more of it for next year. If you're able to go get it from a secondary marketplace, um, then you're avoiding kind of that urge to the company um, and, you're, and you're taking something um, that wasn't gonna have an end use anyway. So, you know, those marketplaces like eBay um, or refurbished marketplace, I think Amazon has a refurbished side, mostly for, for electronics, Poshmark, ThreadUp, um, 
Optoro has a couple of proprietary marketplaces where I do some of my holiday shopping. Um, the direct to consumer one is called blink.com, B L I N Q. Um, and so that's a little pro tip for your holiday shopping. Um, you know, there, there's a number of different places out there um, where you can find used or like new or open box goods. And that that's really a great way of making your shopping more sustainable. Oh my goodness. I love that. There's so much talk about like shopping local, which is obviously very important, yeah. but I'm loving this shop refurbished as well. So adding that to my list. Um, there are quite a few questions we didn't get to. I apologize team, but I would encourage you to keep this conversation going. Please feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to annoy Megan just a little bit um, and get a few more answers if she doesn't mind. Um, I also want to encourage you there's another way to stay involved in this conversation um we have our yearly uh, summit coming up next in just a few weeks actually my goodness december is sneaking up on me i'm uh, december 3rd and 4th um and we'd really encourage you love you to come we actually this year for the first time have a free ticket um so if you'd like to come and just hear a keynote keynote and come to the exhibit hall we'd love we'd love to have you and have um, not um, be price prohibitive at any point so please join us for this event um we'll include some information in the follow-up on how to get those registers but um i'm i've just been absolutely geeking out for the last hour may and so thank you so much um for taking the time to chat today thank you everyone for joining in this webinar and i hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day thank you